Uh, hello, we are going to talk about sequencing technology and virus discovery. So uh, I think there was an ama amazing uh, change in the way we do sequencing nowadays. So this is the first generation, the two guys who got the Nobel Prize for developing uh, the initial uh, ways of sequencing that Sanger and, and, and Max Gilbert. But, uh, and this technology uh, uh, was the main technology until 2000 when the first draft of human genome was made. So all the first human genome was done using this, this, uh, the Sanger technology. But after that, uh, it was too expensive uh, to keep doing Sanger, since we do need large human genomes and, and more people being sequenced. So there was a, 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 a yeah, work to, to try to improve the ways we were doing sequencing. And the way it moved was, uh, it's called now next generation sequence. And the change is mainly that instead of doing a bulk PCR where you do the sequence, of the entire population in one run, what you do in the next generation and do is to do parallel sequence of many molecules. And here I just show the main difference. So this is how the Sanger sequence appears. You, you do, here is a base that CC and you see clear uh, the C and here is, is how it would appear in a next generation sequence. And in the case of a mixture, like here, what you see is like a mixture. You see each base separated, and you may quantify and know the proportion that the, this sequence is there. So for human genomes, normally it's 50 and 50, but for virus, this is key. So you can also understand the proportion of certain mutations in the entire population. So what moved and the first uh, machine that was able to use this technology was the 454 machine from Roche. And what they do is first to get the, 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 the initial uh, templates and break into pieces and then put each piece in a small emulsion uh, of oil that would drive, and then they run the PCR in, inside. So each PCR is separated. And so you have for each, each uh, small piece, everything. And, and then when you, you add this, uh, this small balls here, you, you can sequence each one separate. So that's how it was done. And that's how the 455 worked. Then uh, uh, this is how it goes. So each each is more uh, dot. We will read each time. So you have the primer. Each time it moves, it just uh, leave one color. So you know how how it's working. The machine was a big machine, but as it went through the the the, the time, this machine was uh, still expensive. And especially with the competition with the Lumina Solex, that was the second um, key player in, in, this, in this race, uh, the 454 uh, just uh, uh, was discontinued. So the, in, the, in the Lumina case, the thing is the same. So instead of you having emotion, you, what you do is, is that you have a hybridization. You also cut your, your DNA, you add adapters, and in each one of these, these small holes, it hybridizes, and you have a first PCR, and you have in regions of your, um, of, of your plate, this lots of uh, the same, uh, the same, uh, PC, uh, sequences that, that look like the same because of the PCR. And then it also start doing uh, the sequencing based on, on each one, on each one of this region. And you look and you see uh, through the machine book how the colors is popping up. 
but in this the, the, in this machine you have a reverse terminal chemistry. So each time you add uh, uh, only one uh, one molecule enter each time. Then you have the solid. That's a very different way of doing it with lots of hybrid hybridization, specific probes, and then you see how this is linking and and, and the, the ligase links exactly kind of, uh, uh, you know, the sequence of each one of these, these probes. So that's how you end up doing a, a computer uh, understanding of what was hybridized. And, and with that, you get the sequence. And then there was an update in, uh, with the ion semiconductor sequencing. It's very similar for, to the first one in terms of how it works. You also do uh, endpoint uh, dilution of your DNA into, into those emotions. But instead of, of measuring uh, light, they measure hydrogen and change in pH which made this a little bit cheaper than the previous sequencer. And so this is how it works. So it's based in something that is normally used in all cell phones. So the production could be made it cheaper. And each time a new base enter, there is a release of an hydrogen and, and the system detects the change in pH. So all this machine is more or less the second generation of the machines, this, this slide is a little bit old uh, in terms of what they do, but in general, uh, uh, all, all, especially Roche 454 is no longer being used. And there are also updates, also the AB solid is start not be continued and you have this ion tor and then our other version that's, that do more, more sequence that has a higher input. So these are the ones that are now uh, being used more frequent from this generation of device. And, and the problem was mainly the cost per run that was cheaper using ion torrent because it was a smaller machine. But this changed over time. And with the time moving on, the capacity really went up and up and up and each, each year it, get, it, it keeps improving. And consequently, the cost went down and already reached less, you may get one human genome by less than $1,000. And today it's more ex expensive to save the data than uh, to generate the data again. The problem was mainly uh, one thing that this generation of uh, sequence was unable to do is was to do long reads. And this may be a problem when you uh, assemble your, when you get your sequence that you cut it to piece and then you try to assemble. If you have regions that are very similar one to the other, you may get the wrong, uh, the wrong uh, um, structure of the genome, especially when you have copy number variations. So this is a problem. And the th third generation, uh, machine really changed that. And the adventure is mainly reducing. So you don't have, you don't need to have necessarily a PCR before doing your sequencing. Uh, it, it does have a longer read and may reduce also a sequencing from, from days to hours. And in, in the case of the mini eye, you may even do in real time and get your results very quickly. So this is one of the machines that really do large amount of, of uh, sequence uh, and uh, still in use. And, and uh, the main thing is to really get, get this really long, um, longer reads is the Pacific uh, bio. The other one that's the one we've been using a lot in our lab is the nanopore. And that's why I'm gonna show the video on how this work. Oxford Nanopore Technologies 
has developed nanopore-based DNA and RNA sequencing technology designed to provide on-demand biological information to any person in any environment. Protein nanopores are tiny holes that in nature form gateways across membranes. In our technology, protein nanopores are embedded into a synthetic membrane bathed in an electrophysiological solution and an ionic current is passed through the nanopores. As molecules such as DNA or RNA move through the nanopores, they cause disruption in the current. This signal can be analyzed in real time to determine the sequence of bases in the strands of DNA or RNA passing through the pore. During sequencing, the nanopore analyzes the entire fragment of DNA or RNA that's presented to it, so the read length is directly related to the length of the DNA or RNA in the sample that has been prepared. Users can influence their read lengths by choosing the right preparation methods for their desired experimental results. Standard extraction methods readily achieve reads from the tens to hundreds of kilobases, and gentle extraction methods devised by community users have achieved read length in excess of two megabases. Long reads provide a more unambiguous approach to mapping a DNA or RNA sequence, enabling much simpler assembly. Using nanopore technology, you can sequence DNA and RNA directly, rather than through a copy or synthetic strand, without the need for a surrogate marker. This means modification information remains intact and is included in the signal information provided to the user during the run. As PCR isn't necessary for nanopore sequencing, amplification bias is removed and library preparation workflows are simpler. All Oxford nanopore sequencing devices use the same core technology, making it simple to pilot experiments and scale depending on the application. From the handheld Flongel and Minine to the benchtop Gridine and Promethine, devices are available to perform on-demand sequencing experiments from single tests to ultra-high throughput projects. All offer rapid, long-read, real-time, direct sequencing of DNA or RNA. Preparing DNA or RNA for nanopore sequencing is a straightforward process, taking as little as five to 10 minutes to add the sequencing adapter and motor protein to the end of molecules in your sample. We also provide devices for automated library prep to make what is already a straightforward process hands-off and programmable. Our devices start to stream data as soon as the experiment begins, translating the changes in signal into the sequence of bases locally on your computer or onboard devices from Oxford Nanopore. This real-time analysis means you get an insight into what you're sequencing and the quality of your experiment immediately, rather than having to wait until a fixed run is finished. Users can also take advantage of epitome workflows for real-time analysis, ranging from rapid species identification to human genome alignment. There is also the option to use your own workflows or those from the Nanopore community. Get your starter pack today at nanoporetech.com. So the nanopore sequence is a totally different way of doing things. Uh, it, it, there is no synthesis of DNA, it, just the DNA go through this nanopore and you get these signs here and this move into uh, uh, through bioinformatics. Uh, you, 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 you translate this kind of signs that they, how the ions are changing the nanopore to the DNA sequence. So for this, there is an error rate higher than the others, but it's a very simple uh, machine. And so in small labs like ours, we do use this kind of technology. And now that they have different sizes that can even be used in a small cell phone if you are in, in, in any place and even under difficult conditions you may be able to do your sequencing. So we, we have been using this since the Zika um, epidemic because, because it's small and you can run it quickly it's really important for epidemic and so the first step was to develop a technology to run it uh, 
for the Zika, and this was done with the group uh, from from uh, from UK, and uh, and this technology was used uh, so to do the full length genome. What you do, you do a first a PCR because the 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 virus is not in a high proportion that you could, can do directly sequence without previous amplification. So we do design primers that covers all the, the, the virus. And, and these small PCRs you run in the machine and you get the results. And basically this was used for the Zika. This was a nature paper. Uh, that we could show how and when the virus entered in Brazil and how it was spreading from the northeast of the country to the rest of Brazil and South America. This was also used more recently to understand how the, the yellow fever transmitted uh, in Brazil during the epidemic and how this, how was the way it was moving from one region to another. And now more recently, we've been using this into the SARS-CoV uh, uh, epidemiology. And this was also a paper, a recent paper uh, published in Science where we, we really could quickly in the first uh, two months to, to run approximately 400 samples and show that there were many introductions in Brazil, uh, but only three of them end up into a, a more dispersed virus. Uh, over the, the over the country, and the three plates really arrived when the epi data was showing that was late February, early March. So also this, this same technology was used to test quickly some samples from Manaus early this January, and, and was able to detect the new lineage P1 that was first described by a Japanese group from from tourists coming from Brazil. And also we were in Palagal working with some samples from Manaus. And that's how you can quickly get the results. You don't need to wait a big run. And it's done locally, so it, this is easier to do. So in conclusion, I think it's important to learn all about this new uh, technology because it will be definitely an important tool for virus surveillance.